G'day guys, it is The Coach. I hope you are kicking ass and taking names and I couldn't think of a better person to help me uh, explore Daughters of Cain. Actually, that's a lie. There's like so many people. I got so many angry messages about this show. They're like, <laughs> why don't you ask me? Why don't you ask me, Liam? Um, but like, you know, there's so many passionate people about Daughters of Cain and I, I thought I'd get a different variety. So Liam's obviously spoken about them in the past. I've had Chuck Moore talk about them in the past and Michael, who who is a brother from another mother. Michael runs Daughters, which I do now. He runs Gargants, which I do. He runs Cities of Sigma Hello Heart, like me. So we're basically cut from the same cloth, and I am going to dig into his experience, who's been playing Daughters of Cain quite successfully for a while now, and learning about how he's seeing the new book, now that we've got the FAQ done, and I want to hear how, so how, how he's thinking about the lists and, you know, what's changed, and we'll, we'll kind of unpack all of that. But, Michael, g'day, welcome. Uh, how are you, sir? Mate, thanks, Coach. Lots of love there and uh, love the brother from another mother there. It's uh, I, I think it just comes down to great minds think alike, Coach. We uh, pick the same armies because they're the coolest, funnest, and best to play. I'll, I'll put you on the spot, though. I'm a Legions of uh, Nagash uh, player as well. Um, which is the best Mortark? Is it Neferata, Manfred, or Arkham? Oh, Ma Manfred did nothing wrong. It's, uh, it's, uh... <laughs> yes. no, I, oh, you are, you are actually, a brother from another back, mother. Pl please bring back uh, Vlad. God, that the Vlad storyline was so awesome. I loved his backstory so much. But uh, all right, well, yeah. well, we'll we'll talk about that on the Grave Lord show. I'm sure all the daughters of Cana are, are getting to their cauldron, ready to stabby stabby us, but. Look, if you guys haven't seen this already, Daughters of Cain got a new book. It's 2021. Um, I did a video about a month ago, a month and a half ago, that actually went into the nitty-gritty of the changes. There has been a bunch of changes. We got a new temple in Kiltnar. We had Marathi go down from Ren 2 to Ren 1. She's back to Ren 2. They're back. Um, She's back to Ren 2. We've had some changes to the book. You know, we've had some changes to Sippy Carp. We've had some changes to Mine Razor. We've had some changes. We've seen some good changes, and we've seen some changes that maybe were unexpected. But, Michael, give me your overall take. How are you finding the new book, and what are your initial thoughts so far? I, I, I think uh, the best way to sum up how I love the book is the internal balance is excellent i i think literally every single page of the rules is usable on the table um uh practically every war scroll and each of the temples is actually usable some slightly better than others but they are all usable um uh with with reasonable rules and reasonable points and and that just creates great depth in the book the, the, there'll be so much play in it there's so many different play styles to explore and lists to explore um, it's yeah, also... you're right, because the the old book because the old book was really just about Hagnar and Calibron. They were like the two temples. You'd mm. never run Drake Ganeth. You'd never run the Craith. Sorry, Chuck. Um, but now the the temples are all good. Yeah, temples are all good. All the battalions have a place. Uh, some of them are again more powerful than the others, but uh, uh, with points drops in various things and a bit of bit of buff on various units, they, they all have a place. Everything can be used. It's um, it's very exciting. You will not get bored playing uh, Doors of Cain for a long time with, with so much mix and match. And on top of that, there is no one best list. Um, uh, there's at least four or five lists of roughly equal power levels for the competitive guys. And then there's at least another 10 below that of of competitive and good enough to play on the games and, and make a good fight or a sort of the 3-2 type lists out there all with very different styles, very different um, use of units and play styles, which is, yeah, you're going to see a lot of very different things on, on the table for Doors of Cain uh, at, at events, which is exciting. Yeah, I um, I was really excited to talk it to you, Michael, because I know there's a bit of uh, the community has kind of seen this a little bit differently. Some people have been really disappointed to see some of the things lost. I know there's been changes to the way prayers work. I know there's been some changes to some of these. Again, I mentioned some of the auto include stuff like, you know, the Hag Queen, mm. Mine Razor. Um, there has been changes uh, across the board, and I think some people were kind of surprised by it. But then I think as an overall, the book is well balanced. I think the book kind of got brought a little bit in line to how Age of Sigmar kind of plays. 
And the prayer thing's a bit weird, and I don't know if prayers are going to change in future battle tomes in a future edition, and maybe this is just a sneak peek to, mm. to the way prayers are going to work moving forward. But whenever I played Daughters of Cain in the past, it's always been just flood the board with witch elves. It's either been the, the teleport shenanigans from Calibron, and a lot of stuff didn't see the table. But, but now I'm seeing the new lists. I'm seeing how people are exploring it. We're seeing armies full of life takers and canari. We're seeing armies just full yeah. of snakes. We're seeing people taking whole blocks of Sisters of Slaughter and Marathi doesn't always have to be an auto-include. I'm seeing people running like two or three cauldrons in their list. So yeah, from a list diversity cauldrons. perspective, I've, ne- I've, never, I've never seen Daughters um, explored the way I'm currently seeing it and it's really cool. Yeah, a- absolutely. And, and that comes down to that internal balance is so good. It's not obvious what to take. It's also not obvious what could just be ruled a line in and ignored. Um, and, and that means that everything can be mixed and matched in different ways to explore different different types. It's it's great. I think we'll, we'll probably get to yeah, – you mentioned a couple of things that uh, – some parts of the historical play base were a bit upset with with uh, with nerfage and changes, but what GW giveth, GW has taken away. They've taken away some things uh, and given us some things on the other side to to counter it. And basically, it just means you have to evolve your play style and and play new list, different style to to get what you want out of the book. I'm still excited to play it. I'm still excited to, to play it competitively. I'm looking at taking it to uh, – it's my armies on parade board, but I'm also looking at taking it to CanCon, assuming it happens in oh, 2022. Nice. And my goal as well is I want to go to Adepticon in 2022, which will be March. So I'm still looking at this at a very competitive level. I just don't think it's the auto auto win that it was at some particular point. Oh, correct. Look, Daughters of Cain in its original incar- incarnation was released right at the end of AOS 1 before the AOS 2 drop. I think it was the last battle term or, or one of, and a lot of the rules in there were eye-wateringly good, and it was a foreshadowing of, of where the power in AOS 2 would go. And I think for a while there at events, Daughters of Cain could have easily gone for 12 months there as dominant 65 70% win rate. I, when I think back over uh, the evolution of the game, I doubt there was any faction so dominant for so long and so consistently um, uh, as Daughters of Cain was in its day, while still even all the way up until re- very recent times still being um, competitive on the table. Like Corey Papp up in Queensland has won three major events with them. Um, uh, they've been on podiums. They've been top ten even in even before this new book out. So the book had a huge run of being ultra competitive and still very competitive. And uh, it's now just a refresh to to find what the ultimate best list is for for that competitive gamer. Yeah, no, I dig it. There's a lot of cool options. And the other the other cool thing, and I, I still can't believe the points value right now, is the three endless spells slash prayers. Um, how that blood snake was 40 points, I yeah. will never know. I will never know how that thing is 40 points. So, yeah. guys, expect a points increase at some point in time, but it is so good. It is so, it's- so good. I, I don't have the maths on me, but it's something like an 80% odds to just auto-kill a five-wound hero, which is just incredible to to chomp down and just take out that support hero in the back, and, and it's great. Um, obviously, it could, could take out key other things as well, but that's its its big thing that pays its way easily. Um, and a I long have, threat range, I have... the way, what time it comes out and then moves. <laughs> This is something that, Michael, you put together for us as well um, to kind of talk a little bit about, like, you know, how are you seeing the changes? Because I think some things became a bit harder, you know. For example, Calibron became the the temple because you'd be able to move and do some shenanigans in the hero phase. It's kind of been mm. reined in. Um, you know, Mind Razor and, and looking to bravery debuff your opponent as much as possible was a real important strategy in the old book, which is not so much. And... I tell you right now that that war band that uh, Morgrates war band her stonks just went up through the roof. Uh, she uh, is to me like she's like an auto include. I, I that that is probably the closest unit to auto include in nearly any list. Uh, her points are crazy for what you get for eighty points, and 
I don't know. I, I can't help but think of maybe there was a few of uh, a bit of excess infantry or something in G Dub's warehouse that needed to be cleaned because that was uh that that's the one that really stands out as not being quite right pointed, a bit underpointed to <laughs> to value, which is good. It's good for so, the player. So, but, so you put this you put this together. Like, do you want to talk maybe a, a little bit about like how you're seeing the changes from books and you've kind of scaled this to hot and not. Um, yeah. Yeah, a pretty simple scaling, and it's not a comprehensive list of everything that's changed. There's only so much we could cover in a show, but let, let's start with the, uh, the the hot. Look, Keltnar, brand new temple with cool rules. Like, mm. awesome. Um, there's a lot of people talking that Keltnar is is potentially the, the best of the lot, and that's debatable and probably needs to play out on the table a bit. So new temple has to be hot. Uh, uh, if we if we flick to a knot, uh, and a complex knot is Mind Razor. Mind Razor is still one of the best spells in the entire game. Uh, plus one damage and plus one rend is awesome. Uh, the uh, the damage being more reliable now in the uh, against those high bravery armies as well because you can get it on the charge, not just be, based on a bravery test. Um, that said. It's now an eight to cast, and yeah. in combination with a few of the other changes to that we'll, we'll go through a few of the tweaks, it's a lot harder to get off with any reliability. It was already difficult to buff, but it's even more hard to buff your casting and get it off. And that's in a meta now with a lot more auto unbinds of from Techless and Croak and and what have you and Zench, where they'll be able to stuff it a lot easier. So Building a list around Mind Razor now is is a trap because it's too random, too hard. The turn that you get it off, plus all the other buffs in combination, you just wipe the table. It's it's so powerful, but it's one of those ones that if you like a gamble, you like to uh, to play the odds, and and uh, you get it off at the right time, you, you'll feel like a god. But but don't build a strategy that relies on getting it off. <laughs> yeah, and even like Steed of Shadows and Mirror Dance went up. And you know, while that sounds negative, Mirror Dance used to cut off on a four. I don't think yeah. I've seen any spells in the in the yeah. modern age of Sigma that goes off on a four. And so, so, but really, you know, while we do say that you know a lot of the spells have you know gone up. They've gone up to a consistent level to right a bit now. To a fair level, yeah. Yeah, I mean, mine raises a bit hard, right? You know, casting value of eight. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Little Marathi can't go on the Bailwind? Was that uh, a change correct. that came in or am I going uh, crazy? That probably is something that needs uh, another um, 100% verification. It, it, it got made as a rule change in Broken Realms uh, via the FAC. A, a, a FAC or an errata came out that made her not go on the Bailwind. But Broken Realms is now outdated relative to yeah. the latest book and it wasn't noted in the latest book. So I, I'd have to say ask the TO on that one uh, mm. if, if you're planning on that combo because it's it's probably a little bit vague. Um, I would assume... Only, 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 only bring that up. I only bring that up because that's a, a one easy way of getting an increase to your casting. So, um, yeah, or casting range at least. It's it's yeah. um, the there was, there was some really janky broken combos you could do there until that a rider drop. But let's park those. But the the mind raiser uh, the the problem with an eight cast is uh, most of the other factions that have an eight cast powerful spell often have a wizard that can get plus two, plus three, auto cast if you're techless, uh, or change your dice to whatever you want if you're a uh, Kairos. Um, so you can get that key spell off in the key turn that you need to get it off with with a reasonable degree of reliability. With Mind Razor, just the gods are going to be, the dice gods will inevitably be against you and, and you'll fail it in turn one and two when it really matters. And then you'll end up getting successfully casting in turn four when you're just mopping up the, uh, the stragglers and the chaff. <laughs> it's, um, so, so Michael, does that yeah. mean I should drop mine razor as a spell or just realize that it's not as easy to cast and have a plan in place that um, it's almost like if I get it off, yes, but if I don't get it off, who cares? Absolutely. That I think it's plan B. Um, there so are still some other, 
interesting spells. I think you still take it because when you get it off, you are going to build the momentum in your army to to wipe. Um, the army does generally still lack rend. Um, it's not mm. a particularly high rend army. Like Marathi got her rend back, which is good, but. Uh, overall, the book doesn't have a huge amount of rend, and you don't have any rend on your your bulk battle line units. So, this is a an important source of rend. The army also does lack a little bit in mortal wound output as well, which is obviously the other way to get through high armor, uh, tough, uh, tough opponents. So, I think just there's so many high armor, tough opponents, you don't have much mortal wound output. The rare, you don't have really easy, reliable rend across the book. So you're still going to need Mind Razor in there. Uh, and you're going to have to just play a lot more carefully around getting it. You have to be ready to pounce and go aggro as once you get it off. Or sometimes you're going to have to play a bit more cagey and play for the next turn to hopefully get it off and, and charge in. If you're, for example, playing against OBR with three up re-rollable saves, if, if you don't hit them with rend, you, you're not going to, it doesn't matter how many attacks you have and how many re-rolls on your attack, you're just not going to kill any of them. And this is probably where the stocks of Drakey Ganeth have probably increased because you're now getting the rend, increasing the rend characteristic of your Witch Elves and your Sisters of Slaughter by one. So if Mind yeah. Raises become harder and you are someone who likes to run that Sisters of Slaughter and Witch Elves, that might now be more attractive than Hagnar, which you might be running in the past. A absolutely. Drachi on the charge, though... A challenge is your witches and sisters are only something I would classify in the sort of medium speed category. There's a lot of stuff that's a lot faster. And a KG opponent's going to throw screens and other things in their way. So you'll hit them with the rend and, and then only having the rend on the charge, you're going to be counterpunched back if you're not careful. Um, without fly, without the deep strikes uh, and, and only medium sort of speed, it's... That it, it is useful having that as a source of um, um, rend, and if you if you don't have Marathi or you're not playing Drachi, you probably need Mind Razor in your list to to get your rend. Uh, the other stock that went up, and and we're jumping around a little bit here, is the Avatar. And the reason I put that in hot is not only did it get a nice points decrease and and it now uh, buffs the prayers when it's the foot up avatar. So for any prayer based build, you get plus one to the prayer roll, which is which makes most of the prayers go off on two up. Um, the uh, avatar is also a key source of rend, both its shooting attack and its uh, sword. Are, uh, I think both are rend too. I don't have the rule in front of me right now, but that in a in an army without much rend. The, a relatively cheap um, uh, hammer like av the Avatar could be a pretty clutch piece to, to come in and solve that tanky unit of whatever it might be, uh, Liberators in a Stormkeep or, or a small unit of uh, more tech Guard that you need to clear out. Um, it's it's going to have a key role in that. So I, I, will say, I, I will say, though, that one of the negative changes to the Avatar is um, the the way the prayers work. So you used to be able to chant prayer and try to activate. Yeah. yeah, you used to be able to ch try to chant a prayer to kind of awaken the avatar. Um, now you can only chant one prayer per priest. So you would either chant the war scroll prayer or a prayer that you've chosen or try to get the, um, the, the avatar, avatar up. And look, if you go Hagnar, it allows you to kind of, you know, fast track that. But yeah. Um, the way that works has kind of changed a little bit. So you've got to be a bit more strategic and, and um, thoughtful on the avatar. Correct. It, 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 uh, when pre the fact where we all thought you'd be able to do multiple prayers as per the other factions, um, the avatar's stocks were looking really good. Um, the avatar now, without being able to multi-spam uh, prayer rolls, is you got to be real careful and build around it and build the list to, to take advantage of that. You'll need multiple prayer um, prayer casters or prayer whatever you want to call them um, to, to do it. Or, as you said, in Hagnar, he now is auto-activated from turn two onwards, which, sure, which yeah. will help a fair bit. 
Um, I suppose that then brings, while we're jumping around, that's a segue into Hagnar. So Hagnar was a real rebalancing. And as as the people that can read on the screen, uh, I've put it in both sides. Uh, Daughters of the First Temple was a... Um, uh, a hot change. Um, where are we? Sorry, I'm now having a mind blank. Um, what does Daughters First Temple do exactly? Uh, I can bring that up. Yeah. You, you, you keep going. I'll, I'll bring it up. Uh, so um, on, on, on the not side is the Devoted Disciples. So I know I can remember that exact rule. The Devoted Disciples is the uh, five up award save or five up DPR uh, after save. And it's been nerfed now to a wholly within range, which means you can't tail a big unit back to, to be within range to to trigger it. Um, so you can't go aggressive as aggressive as the old doc used to be able to go while still getting their five up uh, saves, five up death saves. In addition, the FAC cla or the errata clarified that uh, Devoted Disciples only applies for normal wounds, not mortal wounds. And the meta has evolved to have a lot of mortal wounds in it uh, nowadays um, uh, from, well, we all know where they come from. They're everywhere. So building a tank build around Hagnar has, which was the classic power list, is much harder to do now you can't send your unit forward and with a little string back to to still get the buff um uh which means that you're inherently playing more defensive and castle style and and that's that's a play style to explore but it's it's harder to to win playing defensive than aggressive in aos um the command ability and, uh, allows you to get yeah. plus uh, gets plus three to your movement um, characteristic. Uh, on, so, so for example, command ability you pick one friendly cauldron of uh, blood within. Th yep, that's it. Three Sorry, the, the, yep. it's not so much that the daughters of the first temple is the the first ability, which is um, add one to the number of the battle round, which we will talk about before. So the the rights table um, yeah. uh, is accelerated. That yeah. is awesome. So. Previously, Daughters of the First Temple was you could re-roll all hits from turn three onwards. Um, the reality of the modern game is it's a turn two is where the battle is is really fought nowadays uh, in most games. And so being accelerated up that you get your your uh, re-roll hits in turn two instead of turn three is or re-roll once to hit in turn uh, two is really powerful. As well as in turn one, you are getting reroll ones on your run rolls as well and charge yes. rolls. So uh, all your inventory can run and charge, and you're getting uh, reroll ones on your runs and then reroll ones on your charge. You're getting quite a reliable threat range to to go aggressive um, uh, from turn one, and then once you're in the fight in turn two, then you're uh, you're, you're getting your buffs to your attacks, which is very nice for for Hagnar. So again, uh, GW Games Designers giveth, but they also taketh away, and Hagnar had that kind of is now a different beast of how to play it. So yeah, and another another one of those another one of those changes was in round four. You used to be able to re-roll once to hit in shooting as well. And now mm. it's only melee. So there has been some changes. There has been some rebalancing. It's probably worth knowing that on the Blood Rites table, if you're new to Daughters of Cain, um, these stack. So, you know, once you progress through the table, it's not like you lose the round one benefit because you're now in round two, but rather you keep accumulating them. So, you know, your your army, as it, as it kind of progresses, gets more and more benefits. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if we stay on the, the hot side, I think uh, you mentioned earlier we're starting to see lists with a lot of Canary Life Takers and Heart Renders arrive. Life Takers were always the poor cousin. They were basically the same point as Heart Renders, and Heart Renders were just simply better. Um, it, it, canary Life Takers now got some extra rend on the charge, which may not sound that much but when you actually start looking at the maths of what they do and how much damage they can deliver particularly with buffs they're a real threat a, an 80 point unit that could go into deep strike or be on the table as a really fast flying unit that 
you can stack up a heap of buffs on, like just cast your Mind Razor, do your prayer buffs, and, and we'll go into some of those in, in one of the lists that we've got later on the thing. If you actually run the Math Hammer, a, a unit of 10 Canaries, uh, uh, Canary Life Takers, could do like 30, 40 damage into, into something really, really hit super hard. And then if you get the four up roll and get lucky, you could then dodge back out and cause a road bump problem for the opponent to have to deal with it next turn. So buffing Canary. up the life makers, sending on forward as a suicide missile to just wreck your opponent's day is, is really fast. Jumping, using their fly to jump the screens and, and get into the meat is, uh, they're, they're a little bit scary if you can get all the buffs up and, and uh, everything goes right for you. Yeah, the um, the Canaries used to be in lists for objective scoring. Majority of the time, you'd bring them in either as an ally to another army, or even in daughters, you'd have them and you know have like a, a late game objective scorer. Mm. You drop them from the sky. Um, you get like this, you know, you take, take your shooty Canarii, and they would retreat. You know, you probably wouldn't look at them as a combat threat. In the book, they've really kind of been updated, and people are now taking them for absolute melee prowess. So, yeah, um, they're very, you know, as as Thomas Bird has literally just said, they've actually become really, really good. They've become a really viable choice. And to what Jeff said as well, um, if you are thinking about things like the Avatar of Kane, you know, going under Hagnar really does um, reduce that risk of, you know, activating it early without sacrificing one of your other prayers. So I guess I think, you know, and, and we're going we're gonna to talk about two of, my, two of Michael's lists very, very soon um, once we go through the knots. But I guess the key here is that the daughter's book is really well balanced. You know, if you asked me what do you prefer, the, the Witch Elf Sisters of Slaughter, the Snakes, the Canary, honestly – they're, it's kind of roll the dice. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's it's tit for tat. Like they're actually all quite good. It's obviously just how you build around it, and then obviously your your temple gets chosen. You know your buffs and your support pieces get chosen. Um, but I think I think for me, like when I look at this book, it's almost like analysis paralysis. I could just pick something I really like and build a quite a competitive build. Absolutely. Well, it's almost the case if you can go into the store, pick the models that you think are coolest, and you're going to be able to find a competitive build out of it um, after playing around with yeah. a bit. Um, yeah. the, the other one on the life takers before we roll on is uh, life takers now get extra attacks with um, uh, Marathi being in combat as well, which makes them even more dangerous. That that was an update in Broken Realms, um, uh, but it synergizes with their combat uptake in um in the new book uh and in various of the temples and probably won't go into the depth because we, we don't have all night um is that they, they can be buffed by some of the temple uh sub faction uh, abilities as well so canaries are definitely in the hot 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 category and if people, if, if people want to see a lot of the changes, guys, again, I put a video out just over a month ago reviewing this, and I break down the points differences. I'll break down, you know, the, the changes to Morgrave. Um, the Cauldron's got a really good buff. They they um, they used to have like five five tables, like progression tables for the Behemoth chart. That's down to four. So there's a lot of cool changes if you want to get to like the nitty gritty. But what I'm really curious to know from Michael is how he's taking this book and building around it. But before we get to that, Michael, talk me through the knots. Like, what are the things that are, not. are so, not as good now? So we've already talked about Mind Razor. Calibron, uh, the the teleport shenanigans that were being pulled off uh, that Corey Papp uh, uh, unlocked that list and and just dominated with is that that's unfortunately RIP now. Um, Calibron had a bit of a hard nerf there with having to spend a CP to do the teleport. The ranges are more difficult, uh, the, and, and it is now uh, movement phase. Yes. Look, some of that was actually fair. There was very, very limited hero phase teleports in the game, and that was a bit of a broken power combo that, that was great for a while. But um, nonetheless, it is a nerf compared to where we were. Poor old Witch Brew, the um, uh, the Sippy Cup has been hardcore nerfed in this. It's uh, It used to obviously be automatic uh, to get your reroll wounds and uh, Battleshock immunity. Now it's five, the baseline is it's five up in the early game, uh, which is a one in three chance to, to get it off. 
gets better as the game progresses or in Hagnar, again, it's earlier, triggers earlier to do it. But Witch Brew is not reliable as a buff strategy anymore, which when you then add it to things like Mind Razor becoming, as we chatted before, harder to cast, more uh, random number generation, more risky, well, you can very easily uh, fumble your buffs and fail the Rich Brew roll, fail a Prayer roll, and fail the Mind Razor roll, and no buffs. That's that's a realistic and, scenario that could happen to you now. And I think that's the key, right? In the old book, there was a lot of guarantees. And as an opponent, it was very frustrating that you would just automatically guarantee um, things like the Witch Brew. There'd be all of these things that are just like a guarantee, Calibron not costing, costing a command point. There was just a lot of things. And and I think that's why there was a lot of hate against Daughters of Cain. And, and again, a lot of these changes is bringing them back in line. Bringing them back in Sigmar's. line with some of this stuff. So, yeah. so, so, so it's, let, it's, let, not like, it's not like you've lost anything, but it's just you're now being brought in line. And IDK is going to be the same. I imagine they're going to get a change. Um, you know, anyone who's being brought into the to the way we play Age of Sigma now as Battle Terms get updated. So don't get too yeah. negative that you lost Mind Razor or it's not as effective and, you know, you sippy cup. It's just how do you build around the new tools at your disposal. You can't get everything all the time. Well, I, I'm actually really, really excited about it because these kind of changes um, really reward gen good generalship as opposed to just net listing a, a net list and and power and using the power of automatic skills. Well, there is a real skill in in how do you play an army where if you get your buffs off uh, and they're random, you've got to be ready to pounce. But if they fail, you've got to you've got to be very nimble on your feet to change your strategy on the fly to then avoid being stomped back. It's uh, so it's um, there'll be a real art to, to of generalship that will be rewarded in in this army now. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and good on people like Jeff who are excited because because I think I think initially it kind of shocked a few people, but again, I, I really like this book, um, and I yeah. hope you all and, find your way. And and. Look, the, those old strategies were all power and whatever, but we also got some very aggressive points drops too. So not only was things like more Graith awesome, the Canaries are great, Keltnar as, as a new toy, the Medusa, we haven't talked about her yet. Um, she got a big uplift. Her combat went up. Her shooting attack is now incredible at 12-inch range to do a uh, death stare that wipes out hordes. Um, she now is a double unbind in a meta where there's increasing numbers of, un of uh, spells. So being able to at least, at least uh, soften Co the pain. Cauldrons went down. Doomfire Cauldrons Warlocks went down. Went down. 50 points. Um, there's some big, yeah, some really big changes. Uh, big More offsets, went yeah. down. Witch Elves went down. Although they lost their... Um, uh, their horde bonus. They yeah. uh, there's been a lot of drops across the board. Well, so a, a twenty point unit of witch elves went down by forty points. A twenty man or twenty yeah, woman yeah. unit of witch elves uh, uh, went down by forty points. So that's how I view them. Rather than well, lost their horde discount, it doesn't matter. The the twenty man slot, which is a nice slot to go in, got a forty point drop. It's awesome. Yeah, awesome. Um, we'll probably wrap up on this page with just the final one because it's, again, near and dear to our hearts, is we can now ally in all our city's armies, Coach. That is so exciting. And I, I haven't really yet explored the potential of that about what I would actually want to pull in here. But we, we I suppose we did mention a couple of things that, that uh, the list or the army has its weaknesses. It doesn't have much rent. It doesn't have much mortal wounds. So, okay, is there something that we could pull in from cities now that, that can help with that stuff? Maybe. Not sure. But that's probably a whole nother conversation, but it's there. Another one that's actually pretty obvious to, to consider taking is because of its synergy is the Battle Mage of Gur, where his basic spell wild form is plus two to run and charge. And when a large chunk of your army runs and charges with rerolls to it, you can race across the table if you've got the Battle Major Gur and you build a uh, build a strategy around that. Your your, your slow foot slogging blobs could can easily get across the table with that strategy. Um, or a or a sorceress with her little stabby stabby dread uh, uh, dread spears. And get yourself chromatic cogs, and now your whole army's plus two, and uh, um, everything. You know, yeah. 
you know, like uh, Alex Tubb mentioning right now, the Frost Heart Phoenix. Frost Heart like, Phoenix, know, Cities, yeah. Cities of Sigma has one of the deepest rosters in this game. So you, you want to get Iron Drakes, you want to get yourself um, some, like there's so much choice. But, um, and I think, you know, to Nathan's comment here, you know, do you think we'll see, um, you know, points rises in the future? I think things at the moment are quite well balanced. Other than the Blood Snake, that, that, sna- that, that endless spell snake is too cheap, um, and I think as well More the uh, sh- More a bit, bit. I think bit the shadow off. stalkers are asking for an update. A hundred points for those shadow stalkers. Um, I think enjoy. It. I, I think they're a little bit too cheap. That so sh- shadow stalkers are really tough here because. They're now they're now twenty points cheaper, uh, twenty points more expensive than your canaries, which they need to be. Canaries, uh, at the same point, shadow stalkers dominate canaries, so canaries need to be cheaper. Twenty points cheaper is probably about fair. Maybe should be thirty points cheaper relative. But the other side is um, having played with both units, I still rate shadow warriors as better than shadow stalkers. Shadow stalkers being able to teleport every game. Every turn can be a late game uh, shenanigan threat to steal objectives and create that objective pressure that has a lot of strategic value. But I still overall am, am rating Shadow Warriors better. Shadow Warriors are 110. And so you go, well, if Shadow Warriors are better, then, uh, then Shadow Stalkers need to be slightly cheaper. I think the actual relativity there is Shadow Warriors are probably 10 points too cheap and they need to go up and then Shadow Stalkers well. go up a little bit as well. My, my, my point is is that I think they're right now relatively balanced. Um, there could yeah. be some point adjustments, but I don't think you'll see wholesale changes. It's not – you're not going to be slanished. You're not going to be slanished. No. Um, any final comments about your major changes, or do we want to get straight um, into – Yeah, we'll get into the list. list. Probably the other one, and and anyone who's whinging about this should should take a close look at the mirror. The uh, uh, pretty much all the sub factions now have compulsory taxes on taking an artifact or a command trait, and um, and most of the prayers and and spells now have holy within ranges instead of within. A yeah. lot of all that stuff was legacy stuff from a very old AOS one book, and it's the common practice in all the new books. So uh, that was always going to happen with this update. Fundamentally, it is a nerf compared to what uh, Doc got away with for an extended period of time, but they're completely and utterly fair with the rules balance and how the game works nowadays. So your first list, and um, I'm very curious to, to, to tap into this one because I think most people, when they see uh, Keltner, they're thinking of the Canary build. So um, I'll go through the list. Um, this is what you've called list one uh, snake spam. Um, so it's Keltnar. Keltnar is the, one of the new temples. So you've brought in Zandra. Oh, I was going to say Cobra Kai. Um, Xanthar Kai came over from Broken Realms Marathi, so that's now a legitimate faction. But you've also got Keltnar, and Keltnar is going to give you a couple of things. It's going to get you to um, allow you to retreat and still charge later in the same turn. It's going to allow you once per battle to bring on a flock of Canari. It's going to allow you, if the unmodified hit rolls for the attacks made by melee weapons target Keltnar is a one, they suffer a mortal wound after the attack sequence. And you know, there's a bunch of cool stuff that comes with Keltmar. And what you've built around is the Blood Rack Medusa, which is coming in with Shadow Stone and Mirror Dance. You've got the Medusa Iron Scale, which is the general with the circle flock. And I'm not going to pronounce that artifact. It's a Ginsai uh, Flax. Uh, ta- the, the tax. The tax. Cool. Uh, that is, yep, that's your, your tax. Uh, that's your artifact that you're going to take from uh, from here. Compulsory, you've got. Yep. Uh, you've got Big Marathi and Little Marathi, they've got to come in pairs. You can't take one without the other. And uh, Little Marathi is walking around with Mind Razor. You've also got 15 Blood Sisters, 5 Blood Sisters, and 15 Blood Stalkers. So you've got uh, a combination of Shooties and Melee Snakes. Um, wrapped up with the Vampiric Guard, and uh, Vi- Vipiric Guard, uh, as well as your uh, your Blood Rack Viper and an extra CP. So... How does this all work? Why the have you built this what is, built? The start of this is it's a one-drop list. Um, now, you can play around with it a bit, but all of this, everything in there fits within the Viperic Guard. So you're looking at a one-drop list, and uh, it, that that is powerful to control the game and how the game that you want to play. You can either go with this list very aggressive with it. It's very, very fast to get across the table and with long threat ranges, um, uh, or... 
you gun for you if the opponent can't effectively get to you turn one, you give him give him the first turn, let him do whatever they do, and then you gun for a double turn and you just use the power of this list to just blow through it. Facing into a double turn against this list is pretty scary. It's uh, it's got a lot of firepower between the the blood stalkers probably double shooting with uh, using Marathi to trigger her ability to shoot them twice. The um, uh, doing a lot of damage either they could either be used to clear screens or snipe out key support heroes support pieces. Um, and there's between the double shooting, you're looking at 60 shots. That's uh, dealing mortal wounds on sixes with rend, potentially re-rolls, etc., depending on what phase of the game you're at. Uh, sorry, the re-rolls are gone nowadays, so ignore that. Um, the Then you've also got the Blood Sisters. So the 15 block of Blood Sisters uh, can be buffed up by the Iron Scale to be allowed to run and charge. And when they run they get uh, 2d6 on their run instead of 1d6. So that effectively gives them uh, up to something like a 30-inch um, threat range to to race across the table. Again, noting you re-roll ones in the first turn uh, uh, on your run roll and you re-roll one, ones on the charge roll as well. So the Blood Sisters can just whoo, slither across, race across the table with that buff and, and hit the enemy pretty hard turn one or or whenever you decide to unleash them while the blood stalkers are taking out the buff pieces or clearing the uh, the chaff screen in front of the meat, uh, uh, opening up that charge lane for the blood sisters. Can they run and charge? They can with the command trait from um, uh, Malusi Eye Scale. Or, sorry, the, uh, the Eye Scale. Her, her command ability, not, a, not the trait. And also, it might be um, worth pointing out that the battalion allows you to use a, uh, uh, um, uh, a command ability without spending the CP. So um, basically, an extra CP is is what it gets. So you get the one CP because it's a battalion, and then you get effectively an extra plus CP. So that that gives you this list is CP hungry. So you're probably using the iron scale to get the run and charge on the Blood Sisters or potentially the run and shoot on the Blood Stalkers to be able to um, get them in their threat range to most effectively shoot what they want to shoot. Um, uh, and you're definitely going to be using the command point, Marathi's command ability to force a hero phase attack as well, probably with the Blood Stalkers. But if you're, if you're stuck in combat, you could trigger it on Marathi herself or, or on the Shadow Queen to clear out if, if she's got clogged up and be stuck with just two leftover pieces and, and you want to free her up to charge again, you can uh, unclog that battle. Or if the Blood Sisters need to, again, if you get the double turn, Blood Sisters need to clear out some residual so they can then move forward onto the next threat. You can either do that in two ways with this list. The first way is Marathi ordering them to attack in the hero phase and clearing out the residual. Or We're talking Marathi Kane here. We're not talking about the Shadow Queen. We're talking about Lethal Marathi. Little Marathi, though the range of it's 24 holy within, so it's relatively easy to get. Um, the So that's one way of clearing out a clogged up battle. The second way, which is the key ability of Keltnar, is you can retreat and charge. So uh, that is very effective to reposition either the Stalkers, but especially Shadow Queen. Shadow Queen... If you get all the right buffs up, she's very, very scary, and she could do 25 damage and wipe whatever you want. She could also flub really hard. She's very swingy. Um, I, I, in one battle with her, I think I killed one chameleon skink. On one, she was on the charge with <laughs> everything. It was. She could be really pathetic at times. Um, and, but and I'm sure heart which, render going back up to Ren two will help again. Help a lot. Um, that helps a lot. So Marathi is is swingy, uh, extremely scary for the opponent because the opponent doesn't know if she's going to swing hard or swing soft. And in her ability or, or Marathi Kane's ability to order the Shadow Queen to attack twice, like attack in the hero phase, and then uh, then she can move on to her next threat and next target uh, by moving and then charging into whatever. Or with the ability to retreat and then reposition and charge her in Keltnar, that, that works really well to add to her reliability. Like 
inevitably anything with a swingy profile, the more dice you roll, the more likely it's going to average out to, to what you want it to be. Um, and you don't really want the Shadow Queen bogged down in combat. So retreating out and then repositioning to tar charge into the key threat uh, is is powerful in Kelt, which is probably the main reason a list like this I'm, I'm considering taking with Kelt, to, just so you can get the best out of the Shadow Queen. Can I just pause you for a second? You mentioned the importance of certain buffs or certain benefits um, for anyone who doesn't know the term buff. Um, what are some of those buffs that, you know, are really important to someone like Marathi or yeah, the Shadow so, Queen? So in this list, it's it's really simple. It's just the one. It's, uh, it's Mind Razor, which we were talking about before. So it's an extra plus one on the rend and plus one damage on the charge. Um that that brings Marathi. That brings the Shadow Queen um, up to rend three on her key attacks, uh, and damage four on her main attack. Damage seven on her tail attack. So if you could get the tail attack off, awesome. The other thing that you probably want to do with Shadow Queen in the early game is spend a CP to reroll ones to hit. Um, her entire profile is uh, three up to hit. Which sounds okay, but you've got a, a key attack there that is three up, three up, rend three, including um, mind raiser, damage seven being the tail, but it's only a single attack. And so you're spending that CP to to improve the probability of that working is probably worth it. Um, of course, depending on exactly how many you got, and in this list you've got three starting CPs effectively, so it, it really helps with Marathi in the early game. Obviously, by turn three, you are getting rerolls ones to hit anyway if if the game's still live in turn three. Um, yeah, but your but your list is not built for a turn three. This is this, this is, is literally this is literally Cobra Kai. This is strike first, strike hard, no mercy. And Mez had actually asked a really good point. He's like, "Where are your screens? There and is no screens. This is this is uh, this is full full aggro. No, uh, this is full aggro uh, because you are one drop. So you get to drop. determine that you get to determine who goes first. If you think that your opponent can hit you from range, whether it's through magic or shooting or you know the Iron Jaws, Iron Fast Sun, moving. that can turn one yep. charge you, you've got no screens. Those snakes um, are glass cannons; they cannot take a hit. Correct. So you need to go alpha on your opponent. But if yep. you're like, eh, I'm pretty okay. They can move forward. They can, you know, they can't do a lot of damage early in turn one. Then you can kind of give that away. Um, but you can't Correct. take a hit. You can't take a hit. So you've got to it's, you've got to really maximize this absolute punch to your opponent and and punch them hard. And if you're lucky, get the double turn between turn one to turn two. And it's quite aggressive because because you don't want your opponent to hit you back. Yeah, the, the games with this list are not going to last three hours. Uh, the games probably go over at the end of turn two, one way or the other. Either either they've survived your punch and or hit you harder, and and the list is, as you said, it's made of glass, so it will fall apart if the opponent. With hits. the exception of Marathi, with Marathi, with the exception of Marathi, but she's what, she's two models. She can't hold. She can't control the entire battlefield and with the objectives if the rest of the list has been been wiped out. But it also hits like an absolute truck. And, and uh, if you do face someone that can't get to your first turn and you then get the one into two double, then it's uh, you're going to mop them up and absolutely steamroll through them like a truck. Um, it's, yeah, it's also a lot of fun to play. It's not particularly uh, complex. It's, it's a bit of a... It's arguably just a point and click list um, uh, in, in terms of that general strategy. Um, this is this is this is KO. This is a KO build. This is just correct. Punch it's your exact, opponent. Well, it, it's the exact same archetype. It, it's a it's same with change host. A yeah. low drop, uh, uh, one drop or two drop, depending on exactly how you want to build it. Because there's a bit of flex there uh, in in all of those lists. A low drop list that hits like crazy. If it gets the one into two double turn, you are in real trouble. Um, and that's, yeah, if you're facing against it. Talk to me about the Blood Rack Viper because this is something new. This is brand new to, to players. And um, to me, it's such an auto include. It's um, it's 40 points right now um, as, as a time of recording. Um 
it's got a large base, which is a negative, but also a positive, because it means that the threat range of being able to auto slay. So, um, you know, the, the big reason, guys, you take this is because after the model has moved, um, you can pick a unit that is within one inch of it and you roll three dice. For each roll that is equal or greater than the wounds characteristic, one motto is model is auto slain. Now, why is that important, Michael? Just for anyone who is, is not quite connecting the dots yet. So auto slaying is better than mortal wounds generally. Uh, they, they kind of work the same for like a one wound model. But for two or a three wound model, um, an auto slay is the equivalent of three mortal wounds. And, and that's a lot. There's a lot of stuff that does D3 mortal wounds, but you need to get lucky to, to get the full three. Here doing a flat three and then potentially doing it three times with gob one, gob two, gob three. Uh, so clearing out those kind of multi-wound models can really hurt and just instantly pays itself back. 40 points. Well, you kill one Ishlan guard, that's a 40 point. And probability is you'll probably kill two anyway. You've pa it's paid for itself instantly with one bite. Um, but then it gets really powerful if you can get it in range of that small five-wound support hero. Um, I think I mentioned that before. You need to roll, you've got three dice and you need to roll one of them on a five up. And that's something like an 80% odds to achieve, which is which is good enough that you, you'd gamble it and, and hope that it works. And, and you'd build a strategy around the idea that this is probably going to work. And taking out a five-wound support hero standing there just gulp is is that's usually 120 points or something that you've just taken out and as a key synergy piece for the opponent the other important part to to mention for anyone who isn't familiar with auto slay um is that if there's a, a damage prevention role you know sometimes you've got like those five up mortal wound saves or some type of um after save that's negated there's yeah. literally no save. Um, now, there's things like um, Go Trek, and um, there's go, like you can't auto slay certain things. Like there's some things you can't auto slay, but but they're like all they're guard. all very important stuff. Yeah, getting Phoenix through your guard, Phoenix guard, getting fire through, slayers. Um, your fire slayers that are super durable. Um, yeah, there are there are certain models in the game that are just incredibly tough to take down. You can yeah. auto delete and, them, and which is really cool. The, the Phoenix Guard Anointed is a, I think we chatted about a lot on our, our cities chat. It's a real cockroach. It's very hard to kill, but um, like it's just not, it's so hard to kill. It's not worth putting any effort into killing it. With something like this, it actually is worth taking that key buff piece out for Phoenix Guard lists. What are your thoughts on the other the, two? Um, Before we go to the other list... What are your thoughts on the other two? You got the Blade Win, and then you've got the Heart of Fury. So your Blade Win's going to do mortal wounds. It's kind of like Quicksilver Swords, but not. It's kind of like that kind of vein. Um, and then yeah. you've got the Heart of Fury that's going to reduce the damage that you take, and it's quite a generous bubble, 12 inches. Like that, I was surprised. So so the first one, Blade Wind, it doesn't really have anything exciting. It's 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 points are fair. It's it, it doesn't do anything that you already couldn't do with things like Quicksilver Swords or whatever. So it's it, sure take it. It looks cool, but not particularly meta changing or interesting. The um the heart is is a little bit more interesting um in that it's a prayer, so your opponent can't unbind it. Um, that said, it costs you a prayer to use, and your prayers are really good. So that comes with a very high opportunity cost to cast. So if I just roll back, before I talk about that as a sec, if I also roll back to the Bloodrack Viper, one of the awesome things about it in um, in a Marathi list is Marathi is a three caster, and she's got, she'll have, say, Mind Razor, awesome spell, you'll always cast that, um, Black uh, Black Horror of Ulgu, or Black Horror, is an awesome damage spell, awesome. But what are you going to do with your third spell? You, you end up just wasting it on a Mystic Shield or something like that. Um, instead, you, you've got no opportunity cost to cast the, the Endless Spell instead of a uh, key spell. So often there's a trade-off with Endless Spells of, do I cast my really awesome Lore Spell, or do I cast the Endless Spell? With, the, with Marathi, just the nature of her number of her spells and whatever, she gets to do both, which is, which means it's cost of only 40 points and taking up a casting slot, 
well, it's taking up a casting slot that you'd be wasting anyway. So it's even cheaper being, in its total resource use. I'm being told by the chat they furiously messaged me saying that the invocation of canes don't cast don't cost uh, a prayer cast as per the FAQ. Uh, so correct. So, yes, that that is right. That is right. So, they, so, so, they so go, that is a free thing. Still, so that's good. It's even better. Even better, right? It's um, yeah, thank God for live and, internet. Uh, make sure you all your mistakes are corrected by uh, the universe in rapid time. Uh, <laughs> no, normally, I wouldn't uh, kind of go to one, but the fact that two people jumped immediately, um, I had to. Yeah, but no, that, that, that's that that's, that's, that's a win. That's yeah. that's a win, and it's. That, I haven't seen win, anybody yeah. use the heart of fury yet, but when I look at it, it's quite generous. It's quite good. I think the challenge is, is that you just don't get. You can't put everything into your list. There's so many things you want to put into your list. It's, it's just you don't have the points. Very, it's very expensive. It's 80 points. So that's that, that's another thing. Like, do you take Morgrith for your last 80 points or do you take Life Takers, which we've talked about are awesome, for your last well, 80 you, points? Or you do you take, take this? You, uh, didn't take, you didn't take a Cauldron. Like, there were so many things we talked about which were really uh, good. The Life Takers, you didn't, you didn't take any Life Takers. Yeah. So at 80 points, it feels a little bit toppy to to fit in to be able to fit it in the its ability as well the bit that i'm um i haven't actually used it or tried to use it yet uh but the bit that i'm conscious of uh and i think nathan's in the chat as well uh nathan uses his fire slayer invocations or whatever and they always fail on there when they when you need them to stay up the the on the uh, you have to do a renew roll on the um as it as it the turn rolls over and you need to roll the three up to keep it alive, keep it on the board and effective. And it will always fail. Like the, the good old fire slayers uh, firewall just always betrays you. It goes down at the wrong time. I will, uh, same I will, with, the, I will, same with the corn prayers as well. They always seem to go down at the wrong time. They're not reliable for you. But Michael, I will remind you while you have a sip of drink is um, you mentioned earlier about the, the avatar of Kane being a really good choice. Um, if you have an avatar of Ken on the table, you get plus one to that roll on having your invocation stay up. So that's a two up that you're keeping this um, yep. this little little support buff piece. So again, if you start to think about prayers and you're trying to maximize your prayers, the synergies are starting to kind of form. Um, but, but if you're the, not really relying on prayers, then you know you've got a whole spell casting range you can tap into. The the other side to think about on it is it, it reduces damage by one. Which against some opponents like uh, like our gargants, that's horrible for us. Uh, against um, against a mirror match or against a cities list or a Mortec list or or um, the vast majority of the meta damage output is one, and it's weight of dice that's killing you rather than high low uh, low attacks high damage. It's it's usually high attacks one damage. So. It actually is relatively situational in the meta about how often it would be truly be beneficial. And so 80 points comes with high opportunity cost because that 80 points can be spent on a lot of other really cool things. More and it may, you may only use it uh, twice in a tournament uh, against, situationally against the right matchup. It's yeah, yeah, it, it, tiny it, bit hard. The cost is prohibitive. I'd rather life takers. I'd rather more Graith. I'd rather find uh, there's 80 points of value. It's a good, good, good prayer, but I think it's just too expensive. Um, yeah. So, any other final thoughts around your Keltnar build? I know people are looking at Keltnar as well, and I've seen some really interesting lists where people have just gone absolutely ham with your Canaries. Instead of going snakes, they've gone just Canary everywhere and using Marathi kind of as his big centerpiece and just running all the combat yeah. Canary. Um, so of that's an alternative build. It, yeah. uh, uh, though it's, again, very glass cannon fragile, super fragile. The um, I think um, probably the one last bit uh, that I like in that one drop list, uh, I think one of the comment, one of the chat room was saying there's there's no screens, you're, you're completely naked and exposed. It is glass. It is lacking a body. So being able to get those five free bodies from the the free summon as well could be pretty important to be able to like grab an objective or or tag a unit in some way and and just mess with the opponent or, or buy some extra time if you need to. So um, yeah, in a, in a list with only a hundred wounds and most of it being very fragile, every extra body uh, that you can get for free is is nice too. It's not why you go Keltnar. I'm mostly going Keltnar 
for Marathi to be unlocked to reposition in that list, because that's I think Marathi is the best synergy with that retreat and charge combo. But um, uh, yeah, I'll take the free body, five free bodies over nothing. That's better than yeah. nothing. And and the cool thing as well, guys, is um, if you did take a list that was very similar to Michael's, you know, with all the snakes, um, you always got Xanthar Kai or Cobra Kai to then kind of play around with a different style yeah. too. So oh, and, so there's a lot of – the, the list will work very well in Hagnar as well. Um, slot in there too, very easily. So you Speaking use of the, Hagnar, you, here we are. And so here's, here's your Hagnar list too, right on time too, looking at the time. Oh, but, um, so so I'll run through the Hagnar list. Uh, again, people on the podcast can't see it, so I'll at least give them uh, give them some love. So oh, that reminds me, I need to update the podcast. It's been a while. Um, so you've got your combined arms. So um, this is – Hagnar has um, – uh, People have been running Hagnar for a while, and it's always about Witch Elf spam, and it's about super durability. So I'll be curious to see how it's changed in your list here. So what have you got? You get your Hag Queen on your Cauldron of Blood, which is the general uh, devoted disciples with an artifact I'm not pronouncing, Ufuri or Fury, um, and the, the Prayer of Blessing of Cain. You've got yourself the Slaughter Queen with the Sacrament of Blood. You've got yourself Morgraith the Bloodied. So that is the Underworld's Warband um, who brings her friends with her. Um, crazy, crazy points value there. I love, I love. One, I love that model. Two, I love that yeah, points great cost. model. And her Blood <laughs> Coven are also really cool models too, the, the mix of that. Well, that. well, that got another change too. You used to you used to bounce mortal wounds or wounds to her homies on a 4+, plus and now a 2+. plus. So two up. <laughs> It's a two up, so like makes she, her a ten wound model, ten wounds. Yeah, I think it's like a, a, an eleven. Ele, I think it's an eleven yeah. wound, um, yeah. an eleven wound hag pre hag, yeah. hag, hag queen. Um, you've also got your, your cheaper blood than a normal hag queen. <laughs> it, yes, in addition to that, so you've got your blood rack Medusa with the shadow stone. Uh, we didn't talk about that earlier, but that's giving you plus one to cast, and you've got mind razor, so uh, a staple. You got yourself twenty witch elves, twenty witch elves, ten sisters of slaughter. Your witch elves have the two sacrificial knives. I want to ask you about that because I was thinking that the bucklers were going to be better, but I'll I'll find out your thoughts on that soon. Um, you got your your ten sisters of slaughter, which have your your whips and bucklers. Then you've got te- ten canary life takers, ten canary life takers. You've got the blade coven that has to come with Morgraith. You've got 10 Bloodstalkers, 9 Knight Shadow Stalkers, Avatar of Cain, Cauldron Guard um, with an extra C. I know, you know the CP's coming from the, from the battalion. I, I thought you might have bought one. Whew, a lot to unpack. There's no Marathi. So, no, so, no Marathi. So that's freed the points up to take everything else. You've got all your toys. This has got, uh, other than Marathi and Doomfire Warlocks, it's got pretty much close to everything that you could take in the book, which is, which this is, is awesome. Like, this uh, is like the Noah's Ark. You just like put, put one of every animal something of on, everything. In, in your list. Yeah, it's, there's a lot going on here. There's uh, uh, You're playing with all your toys here, which is awesome. So the core of the list is is around the Cauldron Guard, which is 2 by 20 Witch Elves and 2 by 10 Canaries. Um uh, as the battalion with with one of the uh, hag queens in there, and then everything else is th- this is I called it the combined arms because you you're literally doing something of everything. There's prayers, there's magic, there's shooting, there's teleporting, there's uh, there's deep strikes, there's suicide bomb missiles with the canaries. Uh, once you buff them up, there's um, your witch elves can be turned into into absolute slaughterers to uh, with all the buffs that they can normally get. Um, which is their historical role. Uh, or you could also turn it into a little bit of a tank with Hagnar getting the uh, five up uh, death save, the Cauldron of Blood giving a plus one to your save. Coach made a good point that um, uh, around the weapon loadout, I, I actually think one unit of Witch Elf should be with the bucklers, one with one as pure combat uh, with the knives. Uh, that's that's a, a tweak that I'd make to this as I go just for that flex. Um, and so, yeah, you've got a, ultimately you've got a bit of everything in this that's, um, that, that the list can do everything. It's 141 wounds uh, with uh, a big chunk of the army going to have a five up uh, ward save as well. So it's nowhere near as glass as say the previous list. It's, it can actually take a bit of a hit. It, 
it, it, it's not exactly tanky, but it can at least take a little bit of a hit and still survive to, to punch back. Um, and when it punches back, it's going to punch back pretty hard. But talk to me, because when I think of Hagner, I think of people like Liam, who is is an evil, evil man. And what he does, he, he used to do, was he'd run 90 to 120 witch elves at me. And that would literally, you know, using the fanatical faith to kind of just run up the table. They're super fast. They can um, attack you really hard with Mind Razor. They, you know, super durable with the with the four up or the five up, you know, after save. But you're not doing that, and I imagine if there is a if somebody listening to this is probably a previous Hagner or maybe has experienced Hagner, they're probably looking at this going, why wouldn't I just go all in on the witch elves, um, witch elves and sisters of slaughter? You know what what are the Canary and the Bloodstalkers bringing that I could just get in from more witch elves? So the the key on it is Hagnar has changed. Um, so the ninety witch elf kind of buff uh buff slaughter train that it used to run had a couple of key advantages historically that you don't have anymore one your buffs were either automatic or or fairly reliable to achieve through either prayer re-rolls and and what have you um and hag brew obviously or witch brew obviously it was dead automatic and uh, you could also keep them very tanky by uh, being able to string back uh, five men on, on the back in, in the, the old string to stay in range of the five-up um, ward save to, to keep the – even while you're going fully aggressive and you can keep your um, uh, tank component to it, which made them very hard to chew through because – uh, because of that, you can't do both those tactics anymore. You don't have the reliable buffs, uh, as we've talked about, and you don't have, and you have to play a bit more conservative with that tank. So, to run Hagnar now, the way I'm seeing it, at least, you're gonna, you can't rush the witch elves forward in a big wave. You need to keep them castled up around the uh, the cauldron of blood as a as a as a bit of a death star. And therefore, you need something else in the list to be doing work while that positions for its for its big attack, and that's where the life taker's primary role mm-hmm. comes in to come in first, be the first wave forward, either clear the screens or do some damage or clog up the table to as as your own mid table screens to protect the um, the witch elf death star to to roll in on turn two or turn three. Um, also, like the also like a list that has a lot going on with the the combined arms flexibility. So here you've got the blood stalkers. Uh, you can get off some shots to clear a screen out or snipe out a support hero. Uh, you've got the kinate shadow stalkers to be able to put teleportation pressure on stealing opponents' objectives, which they then have to devote resources to protect or hold back instead of being in the frontline fight, which which again aids the survivability of the list because they're leaving units behind to, to protect objectives instead of being uh, being in the grind fest in the middle. Um, and the Avatar of Kane is is in there both as as a bit of a hammer, but uh, also it's buffing those three prayers to, to a two up. And and as we discussed, the Avatar does work pretty well in Hagnar because it's it activates guaranteed earlier. on. So. Um, Everything has a role and everything has a, a way that it will work where you have to position, okay, what am I going to buff up this turn and send it into combat? And how am I thinking about my second turn behind that first wave kind of thing? And and I, I really like that. So I, I think I said before the, the first list, one drop snake spam is kind of a point and click way to play. Um the old 90 witch elves with two cauldrons was a bit of a point and click play style. It's this boring. Combined, like you don't want to run. It's boring. You don't want to run. You don't want to like be pushing a like 90 witch <laughs> elves and like wow. painting 90 witch elves. Was, and then rolling was those dice. Oh my god! 120 <laughs> dice, re-rolling everything over and over again. Oh Jesus! Um, 
But th this is not point and click. This is a this army will reward a good general, and a a uh, less experienced general is going to struggle with with keeping all the pieces moving on this. But if you can master a, a list like this and and how to play it on the table, then then um, yeah, you're going to do very well with it. So two burning questions: Why have you taken a hag queen on cauldron and not a slaughter queen on cauldron? That's my first question. No, I'll points. let you answer and then I'll points. tell you the other one. 50, 50 point differential. The the Slaughter Queen is obviously better, but um the fifty point differential is is there. Um makes me You wouldn't just drop some like you just wouldn't drop something? Well, what would you drop? You you gotta drop the Shadow Stalkers or the Avatar. It's it's not that easy to figure out what you would drop for the fifty points. What about, like, why not just drop, like, let's say, for example, the one of the Canary Life Takers down to five? You could. That that would be an option. That would be an option. You could. And I'm playing devil's that. advocate here, but yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm playing devil's yeah. advocate here. Like, because, because the, in my opinion, the, the Slaughter Queen is just a superior cauldron of blood. The, there um, is, there is one more subtle thing that uh, around why I, I, I'm kind of defaulting to the hag on cauldron and a slaughter on foot instead of the other way around is diversification. The slaughter queen on the cauldron becomes uh, like uh, the cauldron is already a key buff piece for the entire army. And it's, if any opponent has shooting or ranged output, they're going to be putting everything in it to kill it. It's, it's the devoted disciples rule. The, um, uh, the buffs it gives, it's target number one, so it's going to die to a lot of the meta. So diversifying your risk with putting the Slaughter Queen, who has better buffs because she could trigger the uh, hero phase attack, um, you, you're saving 50 points um, as well as diversifying your risk by having two key buff pieces instead of all your eggs in the one basket. Um, Hayden in the chat, the elf bro was mentioning as well that the hag queen being on the cauldron increases the buff range of, um, the witch brew as well. So that's a really good call. Um, uh, knowing how you know, it's, a, it's you've got to be within, yeah, it's a bit harder now, um, to get a, a bit harder with range. Yep. So it's a really good shout as well. And, um, the other question I had, and, and, and I, I did ask you at the start and I'll, I'll reinforce it now is why would you not go buckler? and knife as opposed to the double or the sacrificial knives like why have you gone the the double the novel knives yeah and i think on that I, I would actually change this around that i'd have one unit with the double knives to be the the complete uh slaughter and uh as the attack unit and the second unit with bucklers and then decide how would i use that exactly depending on the opponent like having some rebounding mortal wounds is is pretty good um uh, on this, I'd, I think I clicked Sacrament of Blood, and I, that's actually a bit of a mistake. I'd actually be taking uh, Martyr's, is it called Martyr's Sacrifice? I think the one that uh, rebounds mortal wounds back on the opponent as well anyway as the prayer instead of that Sacrament of Blood prayer, uh, particularly in Hagnar where you already have your acceleration of your, your rights, so Sacrament of Blood's not quite as needed. Um, uh but yeah, yeah, that is a excellent insight, Coach. I, I, I would have one unit of witch elves as pure attack mode, and one with the bucklers with their rebounding mortal wounds and a bit a little bit tankier. I only ask you out of pure self interest because I've uh, built all my uh, my sisters of slaughter. I've been thinking that I should go buckler as opposed to the double double knives because you're right. Like you know, I get plus one attack for having the paired knives. Uh, and obviously, if you activate Mind Razor, they just become an absolute blender. But then on the flip side, by having the Bladed Bucklers, you get the, the plus one armor save, making it a five up, and they can bounce mortal wounds off on a six. So I guess it's the role that you're, you're, you're looking for and um, and what best suits. Yeah, exactly. That Therefore, take one unit of each, uh, one in defense mode, one in um, uh, one in attack mode, and then depending on what the opponent is, you, you, you send in what you need. So, But uh, I love it. You know, you got, you know, you got your little bit of snakes, you got your, your stalkers, you've got, you know, and the stalkers, are, uh, one thing I love about the canine stalkers is that the shadow stalkers is that you can sit them on a home objective and they can kind of protect that objective early on. And then when you need them later in the game, they can be dancing around the table or, yeah. um, 
or then on the flip side, if you really need them at the front, they can kind of, you know, screen for you. And they are very good screens with the minus one to hit in combat. Um, and then they can be teleporting around the board and, you know, like that's such good value, especially like if, should you find yourself in a late game or find yourself, um, you know, you're, you know, drawing things into combat, which means you can take advantage of it. Yeah. The, a, absolutely. Shadow Stalkers are multi-role in, in that either. A, in a pinch, you can have them as another layer of screen. It, it is only 100 points. Um, <laughs> best reason to take off blades if you already have I'm, 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 build, I, I'm building <laughs> mine reason. right now. Yeah. I'm building mine. Don't so even try and magnetize because... witch elves, man. <laughs> no, well, no cause all, all of mine being converted because I'm slaneshing them. But, uh, um, um, the, the other... Uh, uh, just as another synergy to point out in this list with Hagnar and Cauldron Guard. So Cauldron Guard gives you plus one to run and charge rolls for um, the Life Takers and the Witch Elves. Um, the Witch Elves can run and charge natively with their horn blowers, And Hagnar is giving you re-roll ones on your run in turn one and re-roll ones on the charge in turn one as well. So it may That's be a little bit... Table. Yes, for the blood rights table. So it's it's not exactly reliable, but if in a pinch, if you really if you've got no other option in in AOS, and this is a uh, a, a more generalised tactic outside of Doc, just generally, if you're facing a really bad matchup and you're going, I have no idea how I'm going to defeat this, just go hard, go early, and having. Plus one to run and charge, re-rolling ones, and the ability to run and charge means you can theoretically race across the table and get to the opponent and, and cause them a lot of problems in, in the early game. And, yeah, I think it's called the Lo YOLO strategy. You only live once. And if, if you don't really have any other viable tactic for knowing how you're going to beat your opponent, you might as well go YOLO. <laughs> um, that's, that's why we play guard, because we just run up the table, hope for the best. Yeah. And we just yeah, like yeah. just sit, sit there and, like, if the game ends early, you're grabbing a beer. Uh, if the yeah. game goes to time, hopefully you had a great game. But Well, that, that that's actually probably a good contrast between the two lists. Uh, the snake list is going to be over in turn two one way or the other, just due to how aggro and glass it is. The, your, the second list is going to be a list that, plays deep deep into the game it's um you you if you play cagey you'll have to be careful with your deployment you'll have to send in waves of attack troops in different turns and be positioning for counter attacks and and to handle the opponent attacking you so it's uh, a lot more tactical and if you love playing the game all the way out to the two and a half hour kind of range that that second list is for you if you want to hit the bar early after 45 minutes um the snake spam is 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 your list and I think what's great as well with daughters is that um, if there's something you really like, you really love your sisters of slaughter, you know, you could go the you, you could then continue into the Kraith and because the Kraith really rewards you for sisters of slaughter. If you really love your snakes, you want to go hard on snakes, you've got your Xandri Kai. Um, you know, you've got um, Drakey Geneth, which is also rewarding you for your witch elves and your sisters of slaughter. And as we've already talked about, Keltnar is really rewarding you to go towards the Canary or the Snake Route. So no matter where you want to go, you, there's a lot of diversity and a lot of things yeah. you can do to handle the meta, to handle your personal interest and in what excites you to paint. So um, there's a lot of manipulation where I, in the past I've seen people just stick to, as I said, Hagnar and Calibron, and they get bored of it very quickly because there was only like yeah. a couple of builds. Yeah, absolutely, and that I think we started the show with that. That the the best thing out of the new book is, I think every single war scroll has a place on the table, and and that's that's great. The the one thing to as you point out, uh, these lists are both very viable to switch into any of the the sub factions into any of the temples, and still would generally work, uh, or would work with only. Um, modest changes to them which gives you if you've got a core list like this you've you can then branch out pretty easily the one thing that you can't branch out that easy on is the battalions so, so for if there's someone out there thinking about well, what do i actually pick up first um the temple is not what's going to drive what you pick up first it's probably going to be what battalion you're going to build around first because most of the battalions your units can't really switch to the other battalions that easy without um, 
relatively significant more investment in in models and painting and hobby um, to to rebuild new battalions. So, for example, Colden Guard and Viperic Guard don't have a single common model between them. Um, Slaughter Troop and Colden Guard don't have a single common model between them, etc. So, um, yeah. So have a think for for the new starter to dock. Your probably first choice as you're you're building your first army is to go. What battalion do I want to build around, rather than what temple do I want to build around? Do I need to run a battalion like? I mean, there's a lot of battalions in here, so there's something for everyone. But do you see do you see a benefit in not running one? <sighs> That's a really good question. I probably haven't thought about what dock list that I'd build without a battalion. Um, uh, um, the the old uh, Corey's old Calibron list never had a battalion in it, and and I got a bit of experience with that as well. So you didn't necessarily need the battalion. Um, that said, nowadays, if you're in a if you're in the temple, um, you have to take the artifact tax. Uh, so previously, you could get away with still picking one of the good artifacts uh, without needing the battalion. Now you have to actually buy a battalion so you can get that second artifact to yeah. get whatever the the interesting artifact that you want is. I also think that. Um, the dock are relatively command point hungry in the early game. You're probably yeah. not in the late game once the rights kick in, but in the early game, you're command point hungry, uh, either triggering Marathi to hero face uh, attack or um, uh, having a spare command point for... You, you now need a command point for um, Battle Shock, where Hagbrew used to be able to automatically do that. So that was that's, never, that's, 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 never that, used that, to that. be a problem at, uh, for, yeah. for Doc. Now Doc has to think about Battle Shock. So my default, and I'd like to think about that question a bit more uh, offline and see what, what things I could, could build, but my default is I think Doc will need a battalion most of the time. I, I will say that uh, your Canary and your Snake builds definitely probably want a battalion just because you can't take a hit and you want to be able to determine who goes first. Oh, your Sisters yeah. of Slaughter and your Witch Elves are much more durable, so they probably don't need it as much. But I think to your point, getting the extra command point, get the extra artifact, um, and a lot of the battalions are already kind of taking things that you already need. Yeah. So you're likely to build around it. Well, um, and, and the good thing here is in in the early stage of AOS 2 and even in the old doc book, um, uh, most battalions had taxes. Uh, they had some bit that you didn't really want uh, to get some really cool ability. I, I don't really see any of the battalions as having major taxes here. And, and that comes down to every unit has a role and it has a place. So ex a perfect example of that is the Colden Guard Battalion is completely unchanged from uh, from the old doc book. But because Life Takers actually became good instead of a tax unit or, or a, yes. it was, they were widely considered a garbage tax unit compared to the Heart Renders or the Shadow Stalkers, well, now that they're actually good, well, Colden Guard becomes uh, all of a sudden Colden Guard as a battalion and as a build became better. And your cauldrons went down as well. And your um, cauldrons went down. The witch elves went down in blocks of twenty, which which excites me as as a unit size. And yeah, I I, I do want to say there's one unit that we haven't spoken about, and I think it's a unit that's worth revisiting um, because I think a lot of people have written it off very early. It's the Doomfire Warlocks. I knew you were and... going to go there, and I think. <laughs> I, I, Someone in the chat will probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's about the only material unit that's not in either of the lists that I, that I showed. So um, no, and, 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 I, and I say that because, like, when I look at it, right, you there are 120 points for five. Um, yep. So most people will take ten. So you'll you'll go double in on the Doomfire Warlocks. What 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 they bring to the table is one. They're super fast. They're seventeen, I say fourteen inch movement. Um, they get plus one to cast and unbind when there's five or more models. But the kicker is the spell Doom Fire, which has the casting value of six. Remembering the adding plus one to cast, and depending on how many models are in that unit, they're two wounds apiece. Um, if you have ten models in your Doom Fire Warlocks. They just do a flat six more wounds. So you can be popping heroes like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. If there is five to nine wounds, um, so sorry, sorry, five to nine models, it's D6. 
So there's a real, real potential and the speed is there to support your witch elves, your, your snakes, you know, some, some of these very fast armies. And I think that's the challenge to keep the, the hag queens and, um, and Morgraith catching up and keeping up within the distances is quite hard. Mm -hmm. The doomfire being able to keep up in, and do some real magic. I, uh, I, I think uh, there's something in it. It's just like, where do you get the points? I think, yeah, that, that's going to be the trade-off. Where do you find that points versus the other cool things that also have synergies? I, I definitely think at 120 points for a 10... Well, the way I see it is it's a 10 wound, five, uh, a 10 wound uh, support caster for 120 points versus 110 for a battle mage, for example. Or it's... Um, that can also cap objectives and, and do a rear... Look, they're not great in combat or shooting, but they could do something. They do better than most support wizards with, with that stuff to, to fight, say, some zombies or or dire wolves or whatever. You, you, you can contest a, a flank with them. And then, as you say, a, um, a flat six mortal wounds is awesome because it auto it basically auto kills most small heroes uh, out there. And it would usually lead to a double bracketing of any big hero, which could make a difference too, to, depending on exactly what the big hero is. Um, that's pretty dangerous, the, the flat six. They also got the points drop for 140 to 120. So they, they got buffs as well. Uh, they're in the... In a full list of hot or not, they're definitely in the hot category of um, of changes with the points drop and and the flat six mortal wounds is is quite interesting. Um, I can also see them getting a bit of play as allies if people if and where people can take allies, um, say Stormcast allying in some dock for for some mortal wound output. I, I could see something like that happening as well. So. Yeah, no, that's great, and, and, and it allows you as well to naturally have a wizard in your army as opposed to going into your allies' pool. And if you need allies, you know, the Frostheart Phoenix or, you know, any anything you might want to draw from. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know if Lumineth allows you to bring anything in or um, if there's other, you know, Go Trek, for example, but uh, oh. it does free you up uh, by having a natural wizard inside. Yeah, I, I'm not... So the chat will probably know for certain, but I think IDK can ally dock in um, nowadays. And IDK don't really have any wizards, so that would be an interesting thing to think about. And IDK also lack uh, mortal wound ranged output, but I'm not 100% sure. It's not the IDK show. Don't worry about them. So there's little, there's so. little dad, emotional dad haters. Um but, you know, like to, to the point of Trevor, and maybe we we'll kind of bring this home, they lost a lot of allies, but they didn't really lose them. It was just that in the first book, there was no Cities of Sigma. So they allied yeah. a lot of things that are now just become Cities of Sigma. Just all so, part of CD. And now they get the access to the whole cities instead of the Dark Elf. Exactly components. what I was going to say yeah. is that you now can so tap into your free girl. You can tap your gyrocopters, your phoenix guard, your your battle mages, your um, your your, la your uh, luminarch lasers for for funsies. Uh, though you won't get the the synergy there, but whatever, it's fun. Um, so a lot of options that, that got expanded there. They did lose access to um, Stormcast, so I think Sigma and Marathi are having a, a bit of a lovers' tip at the moment. Um, the uh, and no Nathan, no Nathan, no uh, Nathan. You cannot uh, daughters of Cain cannot ally in Croak. Daughters of Cain allies are Cities of Sigma and Iden of Deepkin. So if you want to get yourself it. an eel or some turtles, or uh, actually a really good ally is Shark. The Sharks have gone down the in sharks, points. The, yep. the net the and then it allows you to stop piling in. It can allow you to you know really impact the pile in. So yep. I think Sharks are a really good ally potential, um, especially yeah, because it's fast. Sharks are sharks are fun. Sharks are awesome as a general ally into anything that can be allied. The the one thing that they lost, I feel, with um, uh, uh, with losing Stormcast as an ally is Aether Wings are awesome. And um, I think somebody pointed out that the one drop snake list had no screens. Now, in an earlier version of it, you might have actually taken uh, three or six. Um, Aether Wings to be just that flimsy frontline screen to obviously not best screen on the planet, but it, it may have been worth it because they're so cheap and so awesome. And you, 
and you do have the leftover points there. There is an extra CP that you arguably don't need, plus uh, I think there was 30 points spare or something anyway, so you could have fitted in um, some extra. But, yeah, so losing the Aether Wings, I don't think Stormcast added anything other than Aether Wings of, of real substance, uh, and Aether Wings are really just you, you're using your spare points to buy some cheap bodies. Um, uh, and in exchange, you've got the full full cast of characters in um, cities, which is uh, an enormous faction. Yeah, massive. It's, it's probably one of the biggest. Michael, this has been robust. Um, I am excited because I, I do I do have this book. Um, I do have an army. I'm, I've been, you know, if anyone has been following me on Twitter, I've, I've even got a TikTok now. Um I, I've oh. been posting up. I've been posting up a lot of my uh, my hobby progress, and you know, I'm doing cauldrons. I, you know, I've I've got three boxes of witch elves slash sisters of sword of built, and I've got two more to build. So it's it's been quite helpful for me to hear how you're looking at the new book and how you're considering some of the new rules. And I feel like when I look at this book versus the old book, there's more options to be on the table, and that excites me as someone who likes to explore a battle tome. So. Is there anything that you want to kind of close this out, or at least, if nothing more, uh, shout out to some crews? And you uh, know. I think I think we're we're right on time, unlike last time where we went for like three hours talking hollow Look heart. At Michael <laughs> cracking, so, cracking the whip. Uh, so yeah, shout out to to the Geelong crew, uh, all the boys there. Um, uh, missed missed out on this week's Tuesday night, unfortunately. Anyone in Melbourne who wants to come down for a game, we play Tuesday nights and and most weekends at several venues. And uh, I probably need to promote the next Geelong event is uh, Winter Wipeout, run by Throw the Dice. So on Facebook, it's TTD Winter Wipeout to find it. And that's um, Richard runs that event. It will be our next major event. It's He's actually tweaking the event format around it. It's going to be a multi-system event. So AOS is the core, but he's going to have some Lord of the Rings and X-Wing and other things there as a, as a major gaming convention for, for others as well but just a, obviously just we all know everyone is going to sign up to the aos event <laughs> just a friendly reminder that like 40 or 50 percent of my audience is america canada and then there's additional uh, like england and then in addition all those people hate you right now because you just reminded them that we're playing events and uh, they're yeah. not so what, what, my what international we community uh, i apologize I uh in the your last... games will in the last six weeks, I think we've had stop, stop six major stop. fifty man events. It's, uh, people are going to people are going to comment and tell and like dislike this video just purely because you've just reminded them they're not playing. Guys, you'll be playing uh, soon. Uh, the lights there at the end of the tunnel. Ignore uh, Michael; he is a jerk. Uh, all, all I can say on that, guys, is move to Australia. We are welcome arms. So as soon as you get your plague under control, uh, we'll, we'll welcome you with welcome arms, and you, you can join our community down here. <laughs> <laughs> all right michael's trash talking uh guys uh and girls and everybody who's listened to this i hope you've enjoyed it i hope you picked up a few ideas and if you've liked it as well there are other shows where i've had chuck moore i've had a whole bunch of people talking daughters of Cain. so if you want to hear a different idea and uh, you know, look at some of the other builds um go check out the other playlist videos and you'll get a, like a, a combination of thoughts but michael thank you so much um this was uh, super thanks insightful. coach thanks for having me on uh, again uh, my pleasure. We'll talk soon. I hope you found that discussion valuable. If you did, give the video the old thumbs up. And if you have a comment or an insight, leave it in the comment section below. The champions over here are my AOS Coach Patreons and YouTube members. So you guys are bloody legends. Thank you for all the support. If you want to know more about the support programs, the links are below down here in the episode description, along with the link to the Discord server, so we can continue this conversation. Until next time, don't forget to name your characters and have a good one.